the law of liberty. 1 Thessalonians 5, look at verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now 1 Thessalonians 5.23 is teaching us that we as human beings are made up of three separate parts. You know, obviously Genesis 1.26, and God said, let us make man in our image. God has three parts, we have three parts. Here it's telling us we have a spirit, a soul, and a body. But more importantly, there's details here about how God's purpose is for these three. He says that it be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's purpose for you in your life is that you would be preserved blameless. And he uses a word here in the very beginning. He says, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And what I want to talk about is sanctification. Uh, really, I want to talk about sanctification of the flesh. I recently came across a group of uh, free grace hippies is what I would call them. I don't know what else to call them. I know all about hippies and there's the free love hippies that was in the 70s. What a mess. What a filthy, vile mess. Well, these were some people that teach salvation is by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, well amen, obviously. But then they went another step and they say, well, there's no sense in us trying to keep the law because your flesh is already sanctified. And I said, whoa, 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 stop right there. We got a problem. This group of individuals is essentially teaching that once you're saved, it's almost like you already have sinless perfection in your body. That you can't be perfected by the law. There's no hope in you trying to keep God's commandments to separate yourself. That's irrelevant. That's pointless. Now, that's not right according to the Bible. And I want to show you some scriptures. I want to talk about sanctification of the three parts. And I want to make it short and sweet. Once you're saved, you are sanctified in the soul and in the spirit permanently and forever. Then it's your duty as a Christian to work to sanctify your body and to separate yourself from this unclean world. God has called us out of the world not to continue living as the world. And this group, it, it really is sad that they are teaching, uh, they're outright teaching against, oh, there's no fundamental Baptists that preach this. All the independent Baptists are wrong on this. They think that we should just keep God's law or something. Well, yeah. And the result of this group is they mock Women's attire, as if, oh, like women have to dress a certain way to please God. Well, the Bible's clear. Nakedness has been defined according to the Scriptures. And you should, not, you should not openly portray that. If you do as a woman, you are shaming God. You're breaking His law. This same group would say that drinking is not a sin. There's no point. I mean, you can cuss if you want, I guess. I mean, how far do you go with such a thing? And listen, we were talking about this earlier with Brother Austin. You know, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Great question, perfect answer. Now that I am saved, what should I do with my life? Shall we continue in sin? God forbid. God forbid. Now that you are saved, you should be working to get the sin out of your life. You should work uh, to please the Lord. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 does a fantastic job here of showing us the separation. God's will is that you would be sanctified in all three parts. If you are saved, you are completely sanctified in your spirit and in your soul. But your body belongs to the Lord, and God's desire is that you would separate yourself and not walk in darkness, that you would not do unclean things. When you do that, you are no longer set apart. Sanctification, or to sanctify, means that you are set apart for a holy purpose. I've used this example. This pulpit is for the church. That piano is for the, the church. They are sanctified. What do you mean, sinlessly perfect? No, they are set apart. They have a specific purpose. It is not for playing rock and roll music. It, this is not for political meetings, okay? This is for the reading of God's word and worshiping God through song. These instruments 
are used and set apart for that purpose. Now, you're saved. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. The Holy Spirit wants to change you and help you to become the perfect Christian, which means being conformed to the image of Christ and beginning uh, to change yourself. And this is important because there is a difference between sanctified and sanctification. There is a past tense to the word. There is a future tense to the word. That should be enough for us to just say, oh yeah, I guess I need to work on myself a little bit to please God, not to keep my salvation. And just to put that to rest, I do want to read you a couple verses. If you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. While you're going there, allow me to read Acts 26, 18. It says, To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. This is red letter. Jesus said, If you have faith in me, you are sanctified already by faith. You have already received forgiveness of sins. This is dealing with the spirit and the soul. It happens at the moment of salvation. Romans 15, 16 says something similar. It says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be accepted, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. You understand, the Holy Ghost does not move into your life until you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you are sealed unto the day of redemption, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, and you are sanctified and set apart. Nothing will separate you from the Lord. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse number 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified. That's finished. In Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all them that in every place call upon the name of the Lord, uh, name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. What's he saying? You're saved. You're sanctified. In the spirit and in the soul, but there's work to do in the flesh. I want to show you. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. While you're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, let me read Jude 1.1. 1, 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. You are sanctified. That part is finished. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. When the Spirit comes in to move, listen, you are sealed, you're separated, you are justified, you are washed from your sins, they're already paid for, that nothing that you do will prevent you from going to heaven once you've believed that promise. That is a beautiful promise, and it's a very unique thing to think about that, that the Father looks down at you and He sees your soul as a soul that's been set apart. You're different than everybody else around you. He sees that your spirit is set apart and you become pure and holy because you're sanctified by God. Now go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, find verse number 11. While you're going there, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, as it defines salvation, it's, it says it is uh, sanctification of the spirit and the belief of truth. Once you believe the truth, your spirit is set apart for a holy purpose. God has a plan for you and he will use you for the rest of your life. The Holy Spirit can work through you for the rest of your life. Now Hebrews 2 verse 11 is a unique one. For both he that are sanctified, that's Christ, and they who are sanctified, I'm sorry, he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We are the brethren of Jesus Christ, are we not? Amen? Right? And he that sanctifies us, and we that are sanctified, we are together in one. We have that self-same spirit, it says elsewhere. What's unique here, the New King James Bible changes this, and it says those who are being sanctified. And this is the problem. There are those out there that teach that sanctification of the soul is a process. 
the Calvinist would tell you, if you don't endure to the end, or well, surely there's only limited atonement and you might not be one, but once you get some, uh, it, we will know once we see the fruit, as you continue and continue and continue, if you endure blameless unto the end, then maybe you are actually set apart. It really is bizarre doctrine, and of course, it's, I, I believe it's satanic doctrine to take away from the finished work of Jesus Christ, to say that you're never really saved until we see the fruit until the end. That's bad doctrine. That's wicked. But then there's this other camp. You have the in the spectrum. You have the other camp, and uh, I call them free grace hippies. I don't know what else to call them. I don't even think they have a label for themselves. There is a group of individuals all across America on the internet and in person that you will find that will simply teach it's okay for a Christian to sin. It doesn't even matter. It's already been paid for. There's no repercussions. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't God say He will correct His children? Doesn't he say he'll chastise us? Isn't he pleased when he keeps, when we keep his law? Doesn't that glorify him when we obey his word? And this is important. This is huge. Uh, one other, it's not in my notes, but go to Hebrews uh, chapter 10 while you're there. In Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 10. By the which will we are sanctified, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. Once you're saved, you're always saved. It is once and for all. Once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, your soul is preserved blameless. Your spirit is preserved blameless. You have a future in heaven. You will never go to hell. Now go to 1 Thessalonians 4, please. Back to 1 Thessalonians this time chapter number 4. Again, in verse 5, it, in chapter 5, it told us that there is a spirit, a soul, and a body, and that God wants us to be sanctified in all of them. In 1 Peter 3, he says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. This is a command. You must set apart God in your heart. You are responsible to separate God from the rest of the junk in the world. You need to clear out your thoughts. You need to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of Christ. You have to fight for your mind to keep it pure and, and keep it meditated on the things of the Lord. So he says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. He's saying, be ready always. Stand on guard in your mind. Don't let the devil in your mind, don't let the distractions keep you from having a pure mind. You're in 1 Thessalonians 4, find verse number 1 at the beginning. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received us of how you ought to walk, and to please God so you would abound more and more. How you should walk on this earth and how to please God. That's what he's about to instruct us. He's going to tell us how to do that. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Understand this, we know that in John, in John chapter 6, it tells us the will of God is that we would believe on the Son. After you're saved, what is the will of God for your life? That you should abstain from fornication. I believe fornication is a sin unto death. I believe those sins are in a category of sins that if a Christian commits and continues to reject God, God has every right to destroy their body and bring their spirit and their soul home to heaven early. And here he says, God's will for the saved Christian is your sanctification. That ye should abstain from fornication. That's your choice. That's your job. To choose to be sanctified in the flesh, controlling the thoughts in your mind, and making sure you control the actions in your body. It's your choice to abstain from fornication. Verse 4. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, 
not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. The unsaved world, they're going to act like that. They're going to do that. They're controlled by the devil. They're taken captive by him at their will. They're just after the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. They're controlled. They have no control over their sins, right? But here he says, hey, you've got the Holy Spirit of God in you. You can make a difference. You can change your life. You should know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. Your vessel is your body. Isn't that interesting? Because we have the precious fruit of the earth. Well, our soul is what God is after. This body is just a vessel. This vessel is not going to heaven. It will never be sinlessly perfect. And it's our job, it's our duty to do some maintenance and some upkeep on our body and to make sure that our body is not doing the wrong thing. We live in this body. This body is not who you are. This world is distracted. They look in the mirror and they say, Ooh, look at that. I like what I'm looking at. I, man, if I do more of these or if I, whatever, they start liking what they look at and they think this is what it's all about, this flesh. But that's not it. In fact, that's the one thing that matters the least. That's the one thing. A bodily exercise profiteth little, the Bible says. It does have some profit to be a little bit healthier. You can be a stronger soul winner, perhaps. But that's not what it's about. It's spiritual exercise that is greater to God. If, you, if we would just get a hold of this and understand, it's our job to control our body, to possess our vessel in sanctification. Control your body by separating yourself unto God and keeping yourself holy unto God. If we will do that, God will reward us. This is our job. Fornication will destroy us. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, please. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse number 19, please. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal... The Lord knoweth them that are His. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You call yourself a Christian. You say, I trust in the Lord for salvation. It's not by my works. He says, good. But now that you're called by His name, why don't you live like Him and depart from iniquity? Verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Now, we just read in 1 Thessalonians 4 that we should possess our vessel in sanctification that's set apart for a holy reason and possess your vessel in honor. He says there's different uh, instruments. There's different containers. Some are for holy things. Other, not so honorable. Look what he says. He says vessels of gold and of silver and also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. When we get to heaven, we'll meet the Christians that have decided to use their body for nothing more holy than dirt, like a potted plant. Uh, I, I call them uh, bedpan Baptists. That's a vessel that's not very healthy. There's not holy things in it. I want to be a Christian that's like that precious vessel that the Lord brings forth. And he says, this is a vessel that I can use. It's prepared for my use. Verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. You want to know how to get more works done for God? Separate yourself, purge yourself, clean yourself. How? Verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. This is kind of neat. God's telling us very clear. Now that you are saved, I want to use you for work. But if you're a dirty container, I'm not going to use you for much. Nobody wants to drink out of a dirty cup. But God says you are a vessel that I can use if you will purge yourself, if you will abstain from certain things, if you will purify yourself and cleanse yourself and make your body separate and set apart for holy things. If we'll do that, then God can use us for great and mighty things. There are three aspects to your body. The spirit, the soul, and the body. At the moment of salvation, your spirit and your soul are set apart. But your body takes some work. 
I would encourage you to be willing to do the hard work to clean up your body and keep your body separate from the rest of the world and not give in to the lust of the flesh so you can be used of God, become that vessel of honor. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your promise that if we will purge ourselves, then you can use us to be a vessel that we can do works for you. Lord, I pray that you would help those that are weak in the faith or weak in doctrine that think that it's okay to remain a Christian in sin. Lord, help them to understand that you will correct them because you love them. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. I just ask that you would help us to grow. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.